Welcome to Docs on Call, brought to you by Methodist Medical Center, with your host, Gina Morse. Good evening. This is Docs on Call. Tonight's topic, prostate cancer. Aside from skin cancer, it is the most common cancer among men in the U.S. More than 2 million men in the U.S. count themselves as prostate cancer survivors. Whether you're worried about developing prostate cancer, making decisions about your treatment, or trying to stay well after treatment, you'll want to watch this edition of Docs on Call. Dr. Matthew Carpenter, Medical Director for the Hydric Radiation Oncology Center, and Dr. Joseph Bano of Midwest Urological Group are answering your questions about early detection, treatments, and what follows after the treatment. Just call 698-3742. That's 698-3742. And more with our introductions. Sitting closest to me is Dr. Joseph Bano, a return guest of Docs on Call. Dr. Bano received his medical degree from the University of Illinois College of Medicine. He is board certified urologist and clinical instructor of urology at the U of I College of Medicine. His special interests include impotency, stone disease, and correction of prostate disease. And to his left is Dr. Matthew Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter received his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. He's board certified radiation oncologist with the Hydric Radiation Oncology Center, the medical director there. Again, thanks to you both for being our guest this You're evening, welcome. lending your expertise. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of the latest recommendations related to prostate cancer and treatment. We'll start with the happy topic first, which is treatment, and we'll, we'll say why uh, the, the first question about that is, is not so happy in some people's minds in a moment. First, treatment. Many advances, uh, among them tomotherapy, right, doctor? Oh, yes. We've come a long way uh, from uh, the way radiation was administered uh, in earlier days. Uh, I'm going to let Matt really expand on that, though. What this does is it allows us to give something called intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is a computer-driven, highly precise way of delivering the treatment. What it does is it lets us target the prostate gland and give a much higher dose of radiation than ever before, but at the same time, we avoid, avoid normal structures like the rectum and the bladder, and the risk of side effects is so much lower with this treatment that it's very striking. Further, we're constantly refining it, making little adjustments whenever we get newer information from the medical literature that is constantly improving our treatment. That's exciting. Targeted treatment is, is the key there, and, and long-term leads to uh, greater survival. In the short term, something we talk about with diagnosis is the PSA test. There have been uh, different recommendations regarding PSA, and I would like to hear from both of you what your thoughts are on the test. Well, I, I think that uh, I started medicine here in 1980 before we had PSA and we would detect prostate cancer. Really the pathologist will tell us, Joe, this person you just operated for benign enlargement, he has cancer of the prostate. I'd see the patient, I order a test, and two-thirds of those patients had metastatic prostate cancer, widespread to different areas of the body. Uh, once PSA has come along, since the early 90s, we've decreased the cancer death by 40% with the advent of PSAs. So I'm a huge believer in uh, prostate screening with PSA and digital rectal exam. Now, Dr. Carpenter, though, you, you caution, though, not to be too quick with PSA or to, to see it as a, as a catch-all, even cure-all for the disease? Well, you have to be careful because there are a lot of men with prostate cancer who don't need treatment. They just need follow carefully to see if treatment becomes necessary. But I'm with Dr. Bano. I support screening with PSA. The American Society of Clinical Oncology is the umbrella group for all oncologists in the United States. They looked at the screening task force's recommendations, they reanalyzed the data, and they came up with some very different recommendations than what was publicized in the national media. It's more important, actually, that you go to a provider who is going to present you with all your options, including observation if necessary, so you know you won't get unnecessary treatment. On the other hand, when we see patients with well-advanced disease whom we can't really help, then we think, oh my goodness, we wish they had had a PSA earlier. That's right. So at least get the PSA and know your numbers and know where to go from there. Let's hear from our first caller. James, thanks for watching Docs on Call. What's your question? Oh, hello? 
Hello, James. Oh, you know, I'm sick all these doctors think know, know everything. You know what I think? I think they should be bukkake. All right, James. Thanks for sharing your opinion with us tonight. Let's move on to another question. Um, we had this caller in here. Bill um, asked, is it safe to be around children during radiation treatments? Yes. Uh, when you get the radiation from the tomotherapy unit, the radiation vanishes as soon as the machine is turned off. You are not radioactive. On the other hand, if you have a brachytherapy implant where they implant radioactive pellets in your prostate gland, we say you have a danger zone, that is, your arm's length, and you shouldn't let children within your danger zone, for uh, and pregnant women too, for a period of four months for an iodine implant and five weeks for a palladium implant. This is probably being overly cautious, but we like to be very cautious about children and pregnant women. So it's different for the tomotherapy unit where there is no precaution and brachytherapy where there is for a brief period of time. All right, so know the difference between those treatments okay. for sure. Jim had this question for us. Is it safe to be on testosterone? What do you think? Wow, well, Matt can go uh, and I could go on and on for this, but um, suffice it to say, I think the, the literature is showing that if a patient is treated successfully for his prostate cancer and he does have um, low testosterone, um, that patient can be given testosterone but monitored closely. And what is the risk? Well, it used to be thought that giving someone testosterone who had prostate cancer was like throwing gasoline on a fire. Um, we've revised that and there's actually been some studies to show that people who have low testosterone may have a higher risk of prostate cancer than people who have high testosterone. Mm -hmm. And some studies show that it may even be protective against prostate cancer. But I have to, tell, I have to re, uh, uh, assure the patients that it has to be treated prostate cancer and they have to be given a cure. May I just say that it, it, there's a man who is not diagnosed with prostate cancer, they don't have prostate cancer, and they need testosterone for their well-being, they will get checked with a PSA, and then it is safe to put them on testosterone. In fact, it really helps the way that they feel. So if you don't have prostate cancer, please don't be afraid of this drug. Very good point. Quality yeah. of life issues are so important. We want to take another question from a caller. Ron, thanks for watching. What's your question tonight? Okay, I'm uh, 75 going on 76. I've had my PSA tested fairly regularly in the past. It's always been quite low, one or thereabouts. And uh, I'm wondering if I need to worry about going and having a PSA test any longer. All right, that's a good question. If, if there is a, a time at which you can stop worrying about taking the PSA test, although you know one of the statistics that I was reading about is that <coughs> you know your your risk does increase as you get older in fact it, it was a pretty startling number something like 80 percent of men ages 80 and over would have that risk of prostate cancer so again i'll go, I'll go back to the history uh -huh. so when i first started out in medicine a 70 year old was uh, really getting up there people who are chronologically 75 but have at least 10 years of life and they're very active, I think those people should still be screened. I think because the type of therapy that we have with Dr. Carpenter and his uh, tomotherapy uh, gives a patient a quality of life. And dying from metastatic prostate cancer is, is not an easy task. No matter how old you are. When, right. What we do when we see someone is we actually look at the Social Security life tables online to find out what their anticipated average life expectancy would be. And you'd be surprised you meet someone who's 75. If they have no serious illnesses, um, they're going to expect 10 or more years of life expectancy mm -hmm. in the U.S., maybe even longer than that. So at that point, just because they're 75 years of age, they've actually proven that they're of good stock <laughs> and they're probably going to live longer so we don't want anything bad to happen to them that we could have prevented. That monitoring is important then. Yes. Very good. Fred, thank you for your patience in watching Docs on Call. What's your question? 
Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm also 75 years old, but I've had uh, an enlarged prostate for years, many, many, many years, and uh, I just ignore it. And uh, I just wondered, uh, should I keep ignoring it, or does that eventually lead into something uh, that I should be aware of? When well, you say you ignore it, are you going to the doctor at least and consulting with your physician? Well, I, I have, but it's been 10 years or 12 years since I've had anything uh, that I would have to deal with that. All right, Fred. So if your symptoms are severe, uh, you need to see a clinician, either your primary care physician or a urologist. Um, sometimes the symptoms of an enlarged prostate are also the symptoms of prostate cancer. So we have to make sure we are dealing with just an enlarged benign prostate and not prostate cancer. Well, and when you talk about those symptoms, let's recap for folks, uh, because I bet there are some guys out there who just think, well, I'm getting older and I'm, I'm having this issue or that issue. It's not really something to worry about, but indeed it could be a sign yeah. of a larger issue. Exactly, so frequency, urgency, weak stream, uh, getting up at night, uh, a feeling of incomplete emptying. Those are some uh, general symptoms, but they pertain to the prostate and can be prostate cancer, can be just benign enlargement of the prostate. Okay. We have another caller. Thank you for watching Docs on Call. Carl, what's on your mind? Well, I have a question about the, um, the, the uh, biopsy. Uh, I did some research and I was concerned about uh, whether or not there's been issues with people dying from the infection uh, at a much higher rate than, than before. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little concerned. My prostate's uh, PSA has been bouncing up and down and I'm waiting for this next result to come in to see if uh, I, I need to get a biopsy done. So I'm, I'm a little curious about that. Well, and, and, and talk to us a little bit more about, you're, you're curious about the biopsy. Give us a little bit more background on, on what you're worried about the, the risks. Infection okay. following a biopsy. Okay. So we looked at our last 600 cases of prostate biopsy. When the patient comes in on the day of biopsy, we give them an, an IM antibiotic exactly one hour ahead of time, and then they're given antibiotics for the next five days. We've had one patient in the last 600 that had any infection at all. Very good. That, that should be comforting for yes. Carl and, and others who are concerned. All right. uh, may I just say that Please. this is one of the problems with the task force screening recommendations. They markedly overestimated the risk of complications from these procedures. When our data is reviewed, actually it compares very favorably nationally and those are very overstated risks. They are risks, but they're overstated. With the use of these antibiotics that Dr. Bano was describing, the risk of infection is very low. There you go. So no excuses not to get that test. Bob is on the line now. Thank you for watching Docs on Call. Bob, what's going on with you? Well, my question is I am 77. Uh, I have a high PSA number I have had for probably seven, eight years while I've had the PSA test. About five years ago, I had a biopsy, and it was okay. I'm wondering if it, since this number remains high, if I should be having another biopsy. Good question, Bob. Can Doctors, I comment to that? Please. Um, there is a process called active surveillance. Men who have had a high PSA and are diagnosed with prostate cancer, or you're very concerned they might have prostate cancer, there's a process that we go through. We don't treat them, we just observe them closely, and this consists of every three to six months, a digital rectal exam and a PSA, and repeat biopsies periodically. It may be as often as every year, as often as every 18 months, or as often as every three years. So if his PSA has been static and his digital rectal examination has remained the same, he may be justified in just observing. But if the PSA is trending upward, a repeat biopsy may be in order. It's something he needs to talk over carefully with his primary physician. Particularly since it's now been five years since his last biopsy. That's a conversation they should definitely have. Thank you for that answer. LaHood is now on the line. Thank you for watching Docs on Call, brought to you by Methodist Medical Center tonight. What's your question? 
Yes, my question is, uh, I was diagnosed with the prostate cancer about six years ago, and hello, are you with me? Yes. yes. Okay, then uh, I did radiation for nine weeks, 45 treatment, and uh, I was getting a PSA check, you know, every three months. Uh, so a year ago, I was, uh, doctor released me, I said, said I have a free of prostate cancer. But uh, a few months later, I was diagnosed with a bladder cancer, and I was wondering what causes the bladder cancer, you think the radiation from the prostate, or what? And the second question, I have a son, and I, maybe, my question is whether we should be worried about him or what? So were, were you a smoker? No, never smoked. Okay, so we're finding out more and more people who uh, have bladder cancer uh, were previously just smokers, but now we're finding more and more were not uh, smokers. Uh, the relationship between prostate cancer and bladder cancer is they're just in the same vicinity, but usually the activation factors are different. You'll never be able to say that the radiation did not play a role. It is possible to have a chest radiograph and catch lung cancer from it. The risk might be less than one in five million. When you get radiation for prostate cancer, the organs in the vicinity do get exposed to radiation. There is probably a risk of a second cancer forming in that area many years later. Often the latency period, the period to which, the time to which you develop that other cancer is more than a decade and uh, the risk is much less than one in a thousand. So while it is possible, it is unlikely that the two are related because both are common cancers. And I'm afraid we will never be able to answer his question satisfactorily. All right. And his was only five years. Since, right, so. right. Well, and again, it's not an excuse not to go through with treatments. There is always a risk of, of some other side effect, but as you were both describing, the that risk of a, a cancer being caused by radiation, for the most part, is, is lower. We yeah. worry about it a lot more in young children and uh, uh, young people, people under the age of 30, than uh, um, the older gentleman that we see. Thank you for your insights. It's time for us to take a quick break. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. That's why we're taking your calls this evening, and we will be taking more of them right after this. Welcome back to Docs on Call. With us tonight, Dr. Joseph Fano and Dr. Matthew Carpenter, brought to you by Methodist Medical Center. We're talking about prostate cancer treatments and recovery. Let's go right to one of our callers, Jerry. You're watching Docs on Call. What's your question? Yes, this is Jerry, and I'm 78 years old. I had, was di diagnosed with prostate cancer eight years ago. They have been giving me Lupron, shots now for eight years and I have I have only got up to about three and I usually stay around one or point one to, or point two and I go every six months and uh, and they give me a Lupron shot and I'm wondering if I should just go ahead and continue with the Lupron shots because they are working or should I and find out about something else. And this is a conversation I hope that you're having with your physician, right? Yes. Okay. After eight years. I think this is very difficult to answer without knowing all the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. We do not know what the degree of prostate cancer you had before, what the stage, the Gleason score, and the PSA. We don't know the exact type of treatment and the immediate results of treatment and what happened to his PSA in the aftermath of treatment. Um, there are some men who have widespread prostate cancer who are managed on long-term Lupron. There are others who need it intermittently or temporarily. It's something he really has to discuss with his physician that he's concerned about being on this drug such long-term mm -hmm. and could it be discontinued because we can't answer that for him. Is that common to be on a treatment like Lupron for eight years? Yeah, it's not uncommon in, in some cases. So it's really, he needs to talk to the provider 
uh, and have a, a frank discussion with that person. All right, very good. Michael has a question for us now. Thanks for watching. What's on your Thank mind? You. Thank you. I had my prostate removed in 2003, and my PSA had gone up slowly, slowly, slowly. Last year, I had a biopsy, and it came back negative. Uh, this year, I had a CT and a bone scan. It came back negative. And then I took a third test of, the, of nuclear intensity. And um, my last PSA was 1.09, and my doctor recommended that I have hormone therapy treatment and Luprin. Uh, my question is, what are the side effects of Luprin? I have read a lot of negatives about the side effects, and I want to know if there's alternative treatment. How, how old are you, Michael? Yes. How old are you? I'm uh, 61. 61. Matt, would you? is this someone you might consider uh, uh, radiation therapy to the bed? Yes, absolutely. The NCCN guidelines state that anyone who has had a PSA recurrence or persistence after prostatectomy should be offered radiation therapy with the hope of cure in addition to hormonal therapy. Regarding the gentleman's questions about the side effects, there are certainly side effects from taking away a man's testosterone. A man can feel blue or they'll have their mood changed. They might lose their libido and not be interested in sex. They could have hot flashes like a woman going through menopause. They could have weight gain or their blood cholesterol could go up or even develop osteoporosis, again, like a woman who went through menopause. On the other hand, in the appropriate setting, it absolutely improves your chances of being cured of the prostate cancer and helps you live longer. It's a question that really needs to be addressed with your physician about the treatment because the radiation and the Lupron both have side effects that you need to understand so you can make an informed decision. Well, and, and in his case, too, to consistently watch that number go up has got to be scary. While at the same time, some of the other tests coming back negative would, would give one a, a, maybe a, a false sense of, well, maybe I don't have to worry about it. I would like to comment that the imaging for prostate cancer is not nearly as good as we would like. To be able to detect a recurrence within the bed where the prostate was removed, it's very difficult. Um, imaging with a CT scan may not show anything, but it doesn't take away the concern that the prostate cancer has recurred. Even if they were biopsying, if they are doing blind biopsies in the bed, that is, they're biopsying an area instead of a specific thing that they see, it might be easy to miss the disease. Well, Michael, we hope that that gave you some help, and the, the number one thing to take away from that is to talk to your physician about this uh, possibility of seeking Lupron as a treatment. Let's go now to Phil. Thanks for watching Docs on Call. What's on your mind, Phil? Thank you. About a year and a half, two years ago, I had a PSA test, and the reading came back as a 1. Uh, less than 30 days ago, I had another PSA test done, and the number was 4.06. What I'm curious about is what are my risks? So a year ago, you had a PSA of 1? Yes. Okay, so we can. Are you having any symptoms at all? Um, I'm not sure what symptoms there are. Um, some sexual symptoms, but other than that, no, none that I know of. Okay, so more and more clinicians are now looking at what we call the PSA velocity, and the PSA velocity is the number from one year to the next. If someone is over the age of 60, we look at 0.75. Under the age of 60. 0.6. If it goes up 0.6 or more in a 50-year-old, let's say, that person has an increased PSA velocity and should be biopsy. Now, in this gentleman's case, his, bi his PSA went from 1 to 4.06, which is a definite increase in the PSA velocity, but also in a, in a young man, 4.05 or 4.06 should be investigated. All right, Phil, you heard it here. Talk to your doctor, get that checked. It sounds like a, a biopsy would be the way to go. We have time for another caller. I think it's William, is that correct, is on the line now. Thanks for watching Docs on Call. What's your question? Go ahead. Are you there? All right, it sounds like we lost him. That's too bad. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, trying to get a quick question here. Uh, radiation history in 2011 from this gentleman um, through prostate wall into lymphatic system, stage four. What does this mean? Um, I don't exactly know what the question is about. It, okay. If he means the stage of the prostate cancer, that does affect the treatment. If the prostate cancer is in the lymph nodes, this is stage four, and it's a different sort of treatment than someone who is stage one who's earlier. Well, and if, if one is stage four with prostate cancer, pardon the way that I'm saying this, is that an automatic death sentence? No. no. If they have prostate cancer because of cancer in the lymph nodes, we can still irradiate and treat them with Lupron or hormones. Um, and even if they have prostate cancer in the bones, there's new chemotherapy and new hormonal treatments that are even better than before. That's great news. So, and we've seen patients with stage four prostate cancer that have been alive 20 years later. Fabulous. Yeah. That's exciting. Well, doctors, thank you to, your, to you both for um, answering our questions tonight. We know there are many questions that we did not get to. And I'm sure this will be a topic again on Docs on Call. Join us again next month when our topic will be William Women's Health. And until then, I'm Gina Morse. We hope you have a great night.